Good morning and welcome to our Brunch and Learn. This is our first of the Ask the Experts panel. First time we're doing this new format. And you also might notice we're in a slightly different setup to normal. Um, if you haven't seen the news, we've recently uh, launched a video capability within Reflex and live streaming, drones, uh, podcasting, whatever you need. So uh, we're going to be asking for feedback at the end of today, as we always do. So um, be thinking about whether you're enjoying the panel, what you'd like to see next. Um, we will also be going back to our normal brunch and learns where we have our one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for submitting your questions. We've got tons of them to get through. Um, I hope all of your brunch boxes have arrived and that you've either tucked in already or maybe you're saving them for the weekend. But um, massive thank you to Erin and Aidan for getting those out to everybody. So um, if you've got questions as we're going through today or any of the answers spark any questions, you can pop them in the chat. Um, normally we'd say come off mute and chat to us, but actually we won't be able to hear you today. So do just pop them in the chat and we'll try and get to as many as possible. If we don't get to them all, we'll follow up with you afterwards and try and get an answer back to you. So let me get the panel to introduce themselves. I'm going to hand over to Andy. Thanks, Becky. Hi, I'm Andy. I'm the head of SEO at Reflect. I've been here about four years. I've got about 15 years of experience in the industry. Um, Self-taught SEO. I've worked agency side in-house. I've also run my own businesses, sold my own businesses, so I can put myself in clients' positions quite easily. Cool. I'm Joe. I'm head of content and digital PR here at Reflect. I joined about six years ago now. Um, I used to be a journalist for 10 years and then moved over to the dark side. Um, and I love it. I love my job. Um, and we, uh, yeah, the main aim for us is to get lots of coverage for our clients. So. Yeah. And I'm Lottie. I'm head of paid media at Reflect Digital. I've got coming up through 13 years, which is an unlucky number. So let's hopefully it doesn't stay like that um, at Re uh, in digital marketing. Um, so my focus areas are paid media, obviously within PPC, display, programmatic and uh, paid social as well. Um, as well as sort of branching into uh, customer experience and very much a uh, focus on a behavioural science-led approach. You're ready. Thank you. Um, I'm Kieran. I'm the behavioural strategist at Reflect. Um, my background is in psychology. I've got experience working in behavioural science within government, policy making, um, in my own business, and now um, in digital marketing at Reflect Digital. So I cover everything to do with human behaviour, anything like uh, research into audiences, customer journeys, personas, etc. And I'll pass. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Gary. I'm the creative director here at Reflect. I have too many years experience. I think the key thing is that I create about a thousand videos a year over the past 10 years and interviewed probably twice as many people. Uh, I run the, the content creation part of the newly created content creation part of uh, Reflect, which is video, photo, live streaming, and podcasting. Thanks very much. Amazing. What an amazing panel. How lucky are we? So I'm going to kick off with our first question. Now, this question actually is inspired by Isabella from the education group. Hi, Isabella, if you're there today. Um, now, she asked the question, what's the future of paid ads? But we're also going to spin that to everyone of what's the future of your area of specialism? But we will start in with Lottie with what do you think the future of paid ads looks like? Absolutely. So I think within paid ads, we've obviously seen quite a big shift towards more of your machine learning and um, AI integration within paid media as well. So I think from my perspective, it's very much more of that um, where can AI and machine learning come in um, to actually enhance the um, delivery of the ads that we're creating as well as how we're targeting people as well. So we're seeing new formats that are coming in or have increasingly been coming in over the last couple of years. I think what we're going to see is a continuation of that um, development and integration of those different types of campaigns and also an improvement of the way that they work. So I think obviously some of these things take a bit of time to get going um, and to uh, develop and be tested. And I think as we're going to see that that's going to become an increasingly larger proportion, I think, of what we're doing. Um, I don't think that's going to overtake completely the necessity for people's intervention. Um, but I think that's going to be obviously a big factor um, that's then coming through. I think in addition to that, from my perspective, we are, we've been talking about audiences, uh, or I've been talking about audience integration with paid media for a long time. And I don't think that's going away. If anything, it is becoming more prevalent. Um, and I think that's obviously just going to be something that's going to continue to develop. Um, and there's a kind of a, a delicate interplay between um, kind of having that audience-led approach and using automation at the same time. So I think it's a really exciting time, particularly for us as an agency, to see how that develops. It really is. And I think that plays in really nicely to, to get Kieran to just give us some thoughts on that, because obviously behaviour is our game here at Reflect. And yeah, I'd love your thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Really similar to Lottie. Um, so for me, I think the future is in hyper-personalisation. So obviously personalization is really, really important to have 
you know, effective marketing strategies. We, we should we should always be personalizing our marketing to the audience. But hyper personalization is using like AI algorithms to actually personalize it to the individual. So rather than segmenting your audiences into different groups, you're actually segmenting into individuals. So this works really nicely on like e-commerce um, websites as well. So when you're kind of browsing through different categories, it starts to learn about you um, and learn what kind of things you're looking for and can offer kind of discounts relevant to you and not absolutely everyone. So for me, hyper-personalization is a really key thing. Do you think audiences want that? Because I think there was a time where people started to think it was a bit creepy when you were like, hold on, how do they know that about me? Or why are they saying that? And yeah, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think everyone's kind of got over the creepiness. I think we kind of expect it. Um, So although sometimes we're like, well, that's weird. We were just talking about that. And then that advert popped up. It's actually so, so useful. And I think if that disappeared, we'd get actually quite frustrated that we're not getting that personalization anymore. Definitely. I mean, I love it. My bank yeah. balance is a bit as much as I end up buying more than I probably should. But um, let's hand over to Joe. Joe, what, what are your thoughts? So for us in digital PR, it's kind of very similar in, t- in terms of being human in your approach. And um, that's so important. Now in, with AI around, um, journalists are always looking for you need to be human in how you're targeting people. You can't just use AI to formulate a press release or a pitch. You have to um, bring that human element into it. Um, the biggest thing for me is data-driven campaigns. So um, looking at the data that you have, be it in, that is so resourceful for you that, that you've already got uh, within the company and that you can then use a date, journalists always looking for data um, and also hooking onto those trends. So we've got the cost of living crisis going on. Can you hook onto that as much as possible? Um, any social trends that are trending on social media that you can hook on to as well. So, yeah, there's lots, actually. And <laughs> it's isn't there. Andy, from an SEO perspective? Um, I think same sort of thing is that um, obviously AI is quite much more prevalent, um, but it comes with a lot of risk of there being um, fact-checking needing to be done. Um, AI is very good at making up information <laughs> and getting quite creative. Um, but as we've just discussed, um, yeah, poses some risk, especially the fact that people want to see human-led content, um, and we like, uh, you know, absorbing information from one another. So, um, I foresee there being a future of SEO being uh, much more AI-led, but I think it needs to be with some caution. Definitely, yeah. And I think we've got some more AI questions coming up in a bit. Gary, from a video content perspective. Uh, yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of things. I think. We will see a lot more employee-generated content, so EGC rather than UGC. Uh, you know, I think you look at, I want to say Deloitte uh, or Oracle, they're like training 80,000 of their staff to be uh, LinkedIn influencers. Uh, and if you can imagine all 80,000 staff all posting on LinkedIn around video content or content in general, uh, that's huge. You know, even for small businesses, if like the senior leadership team were, were posting content regularly. Uh, from an actual video perspective, yeah, I think it's the founders. You know, it's, it's the personal brand side of B2B that's really going to get cut through. Classic cliche, look at Stephen Bartlett. You know, he's got a whole bunch of video content coming out every day, like three videos a day. But also, people overlook the fact that there was Apple and Steve Jobs. Again, another cliche, but there was two brands there. Uh, and uh, Richard Branson Virgin as well. There's two brands there from a video content perspective. It, it, they were like the only two for 30 years and now they're just starting to kind of come through and say oh well, actually founders should be uh like the human side of video content and then if you can have lots of little short clips showing the people because every business uh, does the same there are you know one lawyer does the same as another lawyer but the only difference is the actual people themselves so if you can do human first video uh then you're absolutely going to cut through the noise that's what i see happening in the next six to 12 months Definitely. And I feel like through everything everyone just said, there's a real human first thread running to you, isn't there? Um, Amazing. So we also had a question from Victoria at SCC. Hi, Victoria, if you're there. Um, What trends are you seeing in B2B paid media? This was specifically around what's best for lead generation. So when we're thinking B2B, I think people sometimes struggle. They're not sure how to tackle that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think we're seeing an increasing focus on using account-based marketing as a sort of approach and strategy. The difference between account-based marketing, kind of what people more traditionally may have been doing, is that uh, with account-based uh, marketing, you're doing uh, starting a much um, smaller group of targets at the beginning. 
So it's more of kind of that an old traditional pyramid shape as opposed to what was used before, which would have been an inverse um, pyramid, where you're starting with much broader targeting and then narrowing down your target audience to your final sort of set of people or, or businesses you're looking to to engage with. And that's a big a big shift. Um, it helps with uh, both being more um, sort of clever with your budget because you're all of a sudden starting with just a smaller subset that you've already pre-qualified rather than the alternative where potentially you're kind of reaching that net, that net out and then hoping to kind of uh, qualify those people after you've already engaged with them through through any TAD channel, but for example, through paid media. There are lots of different tools you can use. Um, you can do sort of that qualification piece yourself. Some businesses do it with very simple sort of spreadsheets um, because really all it is doing is identifying who those um, those key leads are, um, qualifying those leads, ensuring then you're understanding what content and how you engage with them and then how you're going to measure with them ultimately at the end of it. So I think that's a big sort of shift around from that more, as, as we said, what we're looking at um, as a business, that more kind of personalized um, and sort of people-led approach rather than that kind of casting the net wide I think that's a really interesting transition. I think for some businesses, it's quite a big change in mentality, like how you're sort of planning and strategizing your paid media. But I think for B2B, that's a real, really interesting way to kind of move away from that kind of uh, broader stroke to something that's much more defined. As I said, that does also enable you to be smarter with your budget because you're now targeting specific businesses as opposed to um, hoping you'll find the right targets through a, a, an array of different types of, of people. And I guess the key with that, that I know we talk to clients about a lot is it's not just how you're going to reach your audience and where you're going to find them, but it's what you're going to say to them, which I suppose comes in to, to Gary and to Kieran, I suppose, from the behavioral side. But yeah, Gary, any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people make a mistake of selling to people for Legion. <clears throat> hey, buy my product. It, it's not going to sell or from a video perspective or from a human perspective, right? Uh, uh, what you need to do is think about the audience. What does the audience want to see? And then tell stories, get them emotively connected. You know, the Gen Zers want to be emotively connected to the product before they actually purchase it. So from a lead gen perspective, you need to tell stories and get people across the line yeah. before they've actually pressed the buy nows, you know? Uh, and it's all about education and inspiration. I, I think you've got to create video content that's nothing about the product at all. You know, you look at Red Bull's Instagram page, <laughs> excuse me, and there are zero photos of the can. You know, they're, you know, they are a sponsorship company and they just happen to sell energy drinks off the back of it yeah you know? no it makes sense and Kieran your thoughts on messaging from a to a um a b2b audience of like they're still humans aren't they yeah exactly um and what you were saying like you don't you don't want to talk to everyone when you talk to everyone you talk to no one at all so um yeah even in even in a b2b context you're still working with humans so you still need to think about who it is you're talking to what are their needs what are their pain points what really connects with them how what resonates with them definitely and so as well I think the point we've talked about a bit about motivation as well because I think often that people forget that it's like what what is the reason why someone is doing what they're doing and that can come not just from a business context but from a personal context as well and I think that's really important I think quite often businesses forget that and they to your point like they forget their people they like oh it's just a business therefore there's not that sort of logic behind it that we would often apply if we were speaking to a personal and individual basis. Yeah. And I think and think with that as well, identifying who the key people are. So the person you're talking to might not always be the decision maker or there'll be other influences as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. So let's let's move on to the AI world, shall we? Because I know everyone wants to talk about AI. Um so we've got a question from Lucy at Move Active. So hi Lucy if you're out there. Um, so how many of us are actually using chat GPT um, or similar uh, as part of your role? And if you're using it, how are you using it effectively? So for us, we um, we definitely do 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 use it. Um, we use it for research purposes mainly um, and for coming up with ideas, just some sort of general, you know, just thinking of outside the box. What else can we do here? Um, <clears throat> it's really, it is brilliant for that. The only thing we need to do, as Andy said, is uh, that just err inside of caution. Um, you need to be producing content that's that's great that uh, that's, that's great for humans and that people want to read. Um, and also, you've got to just yeah, just be careful that uh, say, for instance, you're writing a, a press release and or a, or an outreach pitch. Um, you've got to have that human element to it. The journalist will see straight through it if it's been written that's that's not by a robot. Um, Google will always penalize you if you have been um if you're using ai as well um so yeah it's kind of like 
things around about to read it's great for the for idea generation but for um actual output i'm not quite so sure we still are you know quite cautious of it definitely i know andy and the seo team we've been using it but we've been using it for processes as yeah. well haven't yeah, we yeah exactly um i think like joe says using it for creative content is essentially quite challenging at the moment because it is very creative um and it means that that content can be really you end up spending more time um, editing it than actually you would have done doing it yourself normally. Um, that said, we have found that if you use it for uh, very specific things, so for example, if you've got a website with a thousand products or tens of thousands of products perhaps, where you need to do meta descriptions for something, well, meta descriptions are character defined, that has a character limit in mind. You can give it very specific information, the product's name, the product information, the brand name, so on and so forth. Um, it then limits its options. The AI in terms of what it should, can and should create means that starts it being a, uh, well, think of how long it would take somebody to write a thousand meta descriptions. Um, it's now a press of a button. So um, things like that, when you can save time with automation, I think is the biggest strength of it at the moment. But um, obviously it's going to expand and get better over time as well. And then that comes, poses other challenges in terms of content writing and so on. Going so forward. Definitely. I know we tested it out the other day, actually. We did a brainstorm internally and we um voice recorded the brainstorm and then put that into chat gpt as a transcript first of all asked it to help summarize it um but then asked it could you give us some more ideas and it pulled out a few more ideas that we hadn't come up with so we were still kind of being human person using our brains but that was really clever um anyone else how else are other people using it oh gary's got one so from a creative perspective uh it, i use it as like another creative colleague it's definitely we don't want to use the output, but it's more of a start up a ten. You know, hey, give me twenty ideas for a video. Uh, obviously, be better at your prompts than that, but uh, that's a good start, and that can kind of often kickstart the creative process for me, anyway. Uh, and one thing that I actually was talking about yesterday, which I didn't think about, but it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, from if you need internal buy-in in an organization to create content, and you you have modest budgets to start with before you actually get the powers of B to spend money on it. What you can do is actually create AI video. Ugh, don't create AI video as an actual output for your business, but you can storyboard a video using prompts and get those videos created with AI video to get internal buy-in to say, this is what the video might look like. I want to give all the money to reflect to go and make that video content for you. Uh, so definitely as another colleague, as a sounding board to say, hey, what do you think? But the, the AI storyboard idea, I think it is great. It will save a lot of time and it will help, like I said, internal buyer for content creation. And we also use it for creative use it and the designers use mid journey, um, which has been really useful for some of the like more creative outreach that we do. So like brain teasers and stuff. And that's just fantastic for us. It's just like you say, it's another colleague. Um, we just give them the prompts and it will come up with, we've got one going out today actually. Um, and it's like an optical illusion, but we haven't got the staff that would actually know how to do that, like physically, but using AI, amazing. We can use that and then just tweak it for how we, um, for how we see fit. So yeah, it is useful. You do have to watch it in a bit and also though sometimes, don't you? So the other day I asked it, I had a piece of writing and I wanted it to help me put it into sections. So, and I gave it all of it. And my brief was use all of my content, all of it. Um, and it kept coming back and I was like, it's not all of my content. And I was literally having an argument with that GPT. And eventually I was like, oh, I've tried about five different times. I was like, let me be clearer. Let me be clearer. And then eventually I was like, is there a problem? Can you not actually do it? And it was like, yeah, I can only do this many characters. And I was like, okay, like, it's a proper naughty colleague. So you do have to watch it. I think I wasn't on the upgraded version though. So I think, um, I think when you're using the upgraded version, you've got more. Uh, abilities there. Just going to add to the same thing that even in the meta description example we had earlier. Um, even if you say to it, oh, it must be 165 characters or whatever you want to define it as, um, it still overspills and you have to then put in another prompt of going, no, no, yeah. really take yeah. notice this time. So having text. So I think for the audience, like that's a really important thing that feels like it's coming out of it. Yeah. One other thing, that's this is talking about meta description, uh, it gets to do the boring stuff too. Well, it's the start of the boring stuff. So the YouTube descriptions include my keywords to make it viral kind of thing. That's where you got to write 500 words. That's the boring stuff. That obviously, as a creative, I don't want to do. So it's good to say, you you know, this is a link to YouTube. Write a great description that will help it be easy to be fine. Whatever, the, you know, SEO keywords, for example. 
Uh, that's a really good thing to do because you want to save time writing words and actually go out and press record, right? Definitely. Definitely. It was a fake just last thing. We've, we've, oh, I found real recently, I don't know if anyone else has found that, is sometimes it's caveating the fact that it's like, I, I'm not an expert in this area. I don't actually know. Yeah. Before it then writes the rest of the content, which I think is interesting and something that I see, I haven't seen so much previously. So whether, which I think is useful because I think it also gives people who maybe are under the impression that AI is a solution to everything. Actually, there are limitations to the to the tool, which I think actually is quite is quite handy and important to share because there are limitations to how you can use it. Uh, and also, <laughs> one other thing, the journalists will also have a tool to check if it's been written by a robot. So it's just, you've just got to watch for that. That will then ruin your relationships with them and you won't get any more coverage with them. So again, it's that human, you've got to be human in it and they will check. and. You know, you just can't risk that at all. So everything we do, human first. She had it here. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of more AI questions uh, from Storm and David at Love to Shop. So we had right around, and we've kind of touched on this, but I don't know if there's anything to add. So how can AI be used safely to maximize content creation? And then also alongside that, incorporating it in the SEO related activities. I know like, because I know Matt's been playing with some clever stuff to speed other things up as well. I don't, if there's anything else to share or um, or we have spoken quite a lot about that, so. Um, I think the first thing is to consider the type of content you're creating. Um, if it's like Gary saying short form content, maybe it's like a category description, product description or something where you can't give very specific information, um, that's going to be a big time save for you. Um, anything longer than that, I think you're treading in, uh, yeah, uh, in ground. Um, it's yeah. difficult to get that kind of content um, over the line. Um, the one thing we have been using AI for, not specifically chat GPT, but also we use, um, branded documentation to send to clients. Um, so when we're sending content, we don't just send a, a simple word document. It's in our colors. It's got our, uh, formatting. We have keywords in a particular part of the document. We show what the heading should be. Um, uh, we have a process in place now we're using AI to pull that information directly from the website. So when we're optimizing content, we don't have to, um, manually do that as a process anymore. So it's also considering, I think. Uh, processes in your, in your business that are time consuming and potentially boring how can you get those things to be automated with AI, AI as well so it's not just chat GPT but plenty of other options as well definitely I saw that and that is looking really cool so um, okay, I'm going to start jumping around a bit so thank you I'm going to ask yeah. the, oh. how can you use it safely oh, side of it. <laughs> can go for it um, so like Joe said there are tools out there obviously that you can tell if it's been written by a human or AI and I know when we started using AI at Reflex when we started playing around with it we did exactly that. Like we put in a human content and then AI content and it was accurate. You could tell when a human's written it or not. And I think that's really important to remember because also we humans love other humans. We don't like interacting with robots. You know, we, we like the human element of things. So if you think about some of the most effective campaigns, like think of the M&S versus Aldi argument, for example, that would never have come out of an AI at all. You could get them, you could get AI to kind of generate tweets and stuff, but you have all these like things that people really latch onto and people that catch people's attention is that human element when you've got customer services and it's, you know, it's a real person replying a little cheeky kind of response to whoever's written in. Um, so I think that's really important to remember that. But then there's also the other side, especially from my kind of background as a psychologist, ethics is always, always drummed into you. And like you're working with people, you need to think about things from an ethical point of view. And I think as marketers, we should all have a duty to kind of make sure we're doing ethical marketing. So are you really being ethical if you're just letting a robot do it all and not adding any kind of human element into it? Definitely. You know, that makes perfect sense. So Gary, you used the word viral a minute ago. We did have that as a question. How do you make a video go viral? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> uh, oh, goodness. Can you believe there is a random fire alarm? We're safe. We're all good. It's, you know, it's only our first live stream and we get a, a fire alarm to go. So, yes. Can't plan these things. Uh, we don't make, as content creators, vi uh, viral videos. It's the viewer that makes the video go viral, right? Uh, but you can try and influence it. There's, there's certain ways. In fact, there's only three reasons why a video goes viral. Uh, there is audience participation. Uh, so ice bucket challenge, classic, right? That went super viral because that was all participation. Uh, unexpectedness. So if you experience something that is unexpected, you want to share that experience with others. Uh, and the other one is influence or t influencers or tastemakers. If a, uh, a famous person or an influencer shares that video, that video will go viral. They are really 
the you know any viral video will always go up into one of those three reasons so if you can try and tick one of those boxes when you create video content you're you know you're heading towards the right type of virality you've also got to think about again i think i mentioned this before you got to think about your audience and what your audience wants like the bbc doesn't make video content about making tv programs a little bit but you know uh, it's about the, the hairdresser on the high street is making video content about mental health you know it's that kind of stuff so i i don't necessarily want to watch a video about how to cut your hair uh but i might want to watch a video about mental health so they could attract me by making a video that uh i want to see and but then i'll have that hairdresser on the high street in the back of my head when i need to get my hair cut love it love it it's uh it's all about the people again isn't it yeah absolutely yeah um Another question that we've had in before, so Jessica from Give a Grad a Go. So this is coming to you, Joe. So um, at Give a Grad a Go, they've got an internal system for backlink building, whereby sites we gain links from um, to meet a certain criteria. Mm -hmm. So things like trust score, domain authority, etc. Do you have any recommendations or guidelines mm -hmm. around this? So we obviously, both myself and Andy, we used... Um, the SEO tool Majestic to look at or to measure the backlink profile of particular websites. Um, we do tend to like want to aim for those that are over 40 plus. So it ranges from zero to 100. Um, 40 and below, they generally are looking at spammy websites. So we want to kind of try and avoid them. Um, but then, yeah, anything like say like the BBC, they're going to be like really, really super high in trust flow and domain authority. Um, we kind of go off the back of like, okay, yeah, we could get, it depends on really the KPIs of the client as well. Um, some of our clients just want backlinks. Um, and you could be getting some amazing um, backlinks from the likes of the Daily Mail, the Mirror, Hello, et cetera, which we do get. And it's all brilliant. It's going to raise the trust and citation flow. But then is it really relevant to the audience? Is that what they are going to be? Um, are they going to, it's great for brand awareness, but is it more so, is it really specific for their audience? So maybe like a local paper, for instance, which might have a slightly lower um, trust lower citation flow score, they may be more relevant to that particular audience. At the moment, we're doing a campaign for Complete Pilates. So it's a Pilates company. We get them in the likes of Runner's World, um, Health, Women's Health, all the big top publications, uh, to the Telegraph. Um, but recently we've got them in a the local paper and the CEO is like, this is great. Like, this is really like, they're, they're really happy with it. And it's like, oh, that's perfect. That's what they want. But the trust flow is slightly low. So it's all based on really the client KPIs um, and just, yeah, you've got to think about the overall, the more holistic approach to it. Um, it just really depends. Yeah, it's it's setting that benchmark of what yeah. it looks like, doesn't it? For, like if you are just doing digital PR for SEO, then those metrics are going to be so important, aren't they? Nothing. But if actually you're using digital PR to reach humans, to reach the audience mm -hmm. you want to be, et cetera. So, no, I think nailed it yeah i'd agree of course like andy's yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> we're in the room uh, as it's contextual relevancy to your links as well um yeah. if if you're building trying to build links for your brand it's it's about where are my competitors getting links that i'm not so like joe's saying is that in uh, publications that are relevant to your industry do you need to look at local events like do you attend local events do they have a listing for when you're at the event can you ask them for a section on the site and a link to you um how can you create links naturally? Basically, don't go after the numbers, go after how you're going to make your brand more attractive to the to your type of um, reader. It makes sense. And some of the publications, if you are looking to secure some, they could be advertorials. So you've got to, when you're looking at a backlink profile of a particular website, your competitors, and they have these amazing links, are they being paid for, essentially? So you just got to make sure you do some research around that as well. Definitely. All around managing the expectations mm -hmm. and agreeing with what it looks like mm -hmm. for you. No, makes sense. Love it. Right. Let's come. Let's come over to paid. And we've got some, we kind of, we've touched on behavioral and paid. So this might be you as well, Kieran. But like, how do you really start to do the audience segmentation piece um, in a world where kind of we're recommended not to be too niche because of the machine learning tools as well? So how do you get that balance right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a really interesting point. I think we see what we were talking about earlier about hyper personalization making sure that we're, we're super relevant. I think the, the key there is that just because it's relevant doesn't mean that it's, it has to be a very small group. People, when you're when you're talking from a paid media perspective, it's more about kind of categorizing people into subsets which are sufficiently of, of a size that means you can still use that automation and sort of AI and machine learning 
technology to enable the systems to get the best performance. So what we're finding now, so in the last sort of five, 10 years, we would have been breaking everything down by a separate ad group. Her audience, for example, was very was quite a standard approach um, and really being very niche in terms of each of those individual sort of targets we were speaking to. Now, with the, the um, see, uh, advances in AI and machine learning, what we're finding is if you do go too niche, then there's not enough data behind the system for the system to be able to capitalize on that. And when you're looking at how the systems need to process your data alongside your competitors, you can then be at a disadvantage. That's why there is that very sort of fine line between being um, segmented enough from a paid media perspective and being too segmented. I think that really does come down to things like the audience sizes. So obviously you're able to look at that. So you can, um, you're not going to be penalized by creating a smaller audience or creating an audience that you don't know at this point what, what scale it will be. So some platforms you can look at the scale, so programmatic or for social. Um, for, from a pay a PPC perspective, you may not know what the size of that audience is until you tested it mm -hmm. um so again it's the case of understanding like you can you can go down that route of obviously being quite segmented and then sort of start to test some of those audiences identify those that are at a suitable scale to really enable you to get enough data to ensure that the machine learning can work off the back of it and then you can still get a lot of value off the back of creating a personalized experience for that group of customers and again that's not um sort of moving away from that kind of, sort of what people may perceive as being creepy is actually um, just providing an answer to the solution that they've asked, and that, but the, or what what is important to them, what motivates them. So, for example, you know, you could look at something down the route of, you know, from a finance perspective, if someone's really um, been uh, identified as an audience that's very um, conscious of finance, then you know that is a really important um, signal that you can then start to speak to them and uh, communicate with them via that route. So I think that that's, uh, that's the kind of route you need to go down. So yeah, it's, it's a delicate balance, but you, you can absolutely um, bring both the automation, machine learning, a lot of behavioral science um, very easily. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think it, there's that brilliant example um, where if you t kind of, I'm thinking about personas and segmenting now, and I've seen some awful, awful personas where, yeah. <laughs> where it's just, you know, like the basic demographics. And the, the danger of doing that is, um, brings back the example I was about to share, if you just say, for example, male in his 80s or whatever it is, British, um, you both Ozzy Osbourne and King Charles fall into that same category. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you think about things that they'll be interested in, um, their likes, what they're motivated by, what their needs are, they're going to be totally separate. So it is a music taste. They're still a lot. <laughs> maybe not. But yeah, so it shows that it's really key to go a bit deeper. Um, but yeah, of course not too niche because then you're really limiting the, the the pool of people that you're connected to. And how do we go about building those kind of personas then, Kieran? Yes. Uh, so that's where your audience insights comes in, not just kind of sitting in a boardroom and going, right, we want to target uh, women who are under 30 and, I don't know, like trainers. You actually need to either go out and speak to the people and find out what it is they want and look at the data and look at the trends or look at your existing data as well and see who is it that's buying from you who is it that's, if you can go even deeper into your customer journey, who is it that's dropping off and then start to kind of hypothesize why they're dropping off at certain points and then start to delve deeper. So it's all about kind of research, talking to people, talking to your teams as well. Um, there's loads and loads of different methods you could use and you should use multiple methods as well to find out who you're targeting. And the aim is that we want to get to motivation led, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, you, you want, want to figure out the why. Yeah. yeah. I think that's something that would quite often work with brands. But you ask them, I was saying, why do people buy from you? Um, but, but, but they don't know. So, oh, well, they, because, because they need that. I'm like, yeah, but that's not that's not why they're buying from you. They need that item. Doesn't mean that that's why they've come to you for that. And I think that's, a, that's again, a really important insight, which some behavioral, some persona insights maybe don't provide that le level of detail. And from a digital marketing perspective, that's what you need because otherwise you're just yeah having someone's gender age or whatever that's really not particularly helpful it's the real reasons why but like the reasons behind why someone does something that actually we need to make sure we on earth when we look at the audiences yeah there's that old anecdote the person wants the quarter inch hole they don't want a drill or well they need to drill but they're looking for how do they get the hole and that's kind of it's the driver of what they need isn't it um that's really really interesting and i guess just thinking, sorry, I'm off the cuff here now, so you'll be fine there. But um, thinking about, so if we've got a persona, so we've, we've got a persona and we know a motivation, how do we turn that into a campaign? Because the channels don't give us tick boxes of 
someone that's motivated to buy something that makes them look good, feel good, etc. So how do we, and that might also come over as creative as well from how that happens. But yeah, I don't know who wants to take that first. Yeah. Um, so what we find, we use a, a, an audience framework to translate the great work that, that Kieran's team does into something we can then activate from a paid media perspective. Because yeah, to your point, with all of the, the great insights, it's about how do you then translate that into a targeting opportunity or, or a particular way you can use that insight within paid media. So the ad copy, the, the creative, the video, whatever it is that you're utilizing. So that's really the, the kind of crux. And I think what I've believe is really important is being able to translate that into something that's actionable because it's great to have all that insight you can be like yeah I know exactly who my target audience is but if you can't actually activate that in any way then that's a real struggle so we look at things from the perspective of okay well what is that initial insight and then compare that to the audience targeting that we actually have available within the platforms because again there might be like oh this this is a great audience but actually how do you how do you speak to them how do you identify them in the in the sort of um universe um, when you're looking at targeting, because actually it's like, what audiences do we have access to? And again, it's about mapping that ideal kind of those traits of those personas to the audience signals that you can then get from the, the individual platforms. And that differs depending on which platform. So Google Ads and Microsoft have um, certain audience profiles they've created based on your browsing behavior and kind of the you know, websites that you're engaging with. Uh, programmatic is obviously third party data as well as contextual targeting that you can utilize. And obviously things like social platforms, as well as the engagement you're doing, but obviously a lot of the data you're putting in yourself. So it really does differ depending on each of the different platforms, which is why it can actually be quite a complex process to translate that work into something actionable. But it's such an important part of, of what we do. Love it. Yeah, and I think this is where like um, the help of uh, machine learning algorithms comes in. Like You have to do the human bit first. So we've got out and done, done the work, figured out who our audience is. Um, but then you let the machine learning do the work. So if it's not, if it's serving to particular people and it's not quite hitting the mark with them, they'll scroll past it. But if it is hitting the mark with them, they'll stay on it and they'll come back and they'll view it again. And, you know, because machine learning, it will learn that and it will keep serving and you'll eventually get the right people. So it's a bit of a test and learn approach as well. Did you have anything else to add? Uh, no. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, but I, I, what I would say is, is that we need to do all of this first before we create the content. Yeah. Right, and I, I think it, it's all good and well, you know, me playing out the grounds and trying to make a cool video. But unless we know what our audience, what our uh, the client objectives is, what the business objective is, and then develop the strategy using all of this human behavior and data and and uh, hyper focused targeting, hyper person personalized, uh, then we then I can translate all of the numbers into or what you should do. Sorry, not me personally. What you should do is translate all the numbers and the data uh, into visuals uh, and get you creative into to then create the content just wanted to say so what what a really nice benefit that now we have um gary on the team i think from my personal perspective is quite often with the, within paid media there can be a bit of a disconnect between the creative genius and then what we're doing which potentially is more functional um and sort of on more that data-led approach and often often if the creative is to your point you have to do this piece first before you then move on to what you create yeah which we then use from a paid media activation perspective actually bringing that together as a as a whole yeah. because you know it might be that you've got a really great creative concept but that doesn't necessarily translate into how we're going to use that from a paid yeah. perspective yeah, that's right. so actually what we're able to do here because we have this is to actually be able to do that which i think is a real benefit to up to the clients that we work with and actually something that maybe you know some other agencies don't have that that benefit and yeah. um, which means ultimately the creative um energy that's going in is going to be to produce something that is going to maximize the return yeah there's no loss in translation absolutely you know yeah. and it go what we do is we go the rational to the emotional to back to the irrational again yeah. and that's the, absolutely the perfect combo yeah so we don't yeah. just we don't just spoil all the fun <laughs> uh, yeah you all alluded to there that testing as well because actually it doesn't matter how much research we do still once it goes into the wild it doesn't always do what we expect it to do because humans are weird so which behavioral science tells us that so uh no that's that's great. We've had a question in from the audience, and thanks to your audience, and uh, and keep them coming. Although, well, we've got 20 minutes left, so yeah, keep them coming. Um, so Josephine at SQLI Digital Experience. So this is an AI question, and this is coming over to you, Andy. So um, so it might have been answered already, which we haven't actually. So uh, how much should we already be optimizing for answer engine optimization specifically? So thinking about AEO, thinking about when we're just, people are putting questions in, looking for the answer, what? That's uh, a very good question. Um, we know from SGE, Google is testing um, 
providing that kind of level of information in results. And it probably is only a matter of time until you get that kind of data in results. We do already have it in the form of featured snippets, for example. So when you answer a particular questions, you're going to get the answer. And that's been obviously that way for many years now. Um, I, yes, you should be doing that. Um, I think you've got to consider if it's a question that your customers are asking, um, that you get frequently asked on emails, contact forms, and so on, then it's the sort of thing you should be, I think, answering in your content anyway, because ultimately people are going to Google the questions as well. They're not just going to come to you for the answer. Um, and I think looking forward with SGE and the AI driven answers, um, that those answers can only come from sources of information. So if you are the source of information from having provided that content and answer before, then I think you're in a very good position to be in a, a yeah, strong position going forward because uh, the AI has to learn from somewhere. And I think um, probably expanding on the question a little bit, but um, in the future, I think there's probably going to be some uh, credits needing to be given to answers. I don't think AI will be able to, or Google won't necessarily be able to, in my opinion, just provide an answer without context. I think they'll have to give credit in future. So I think if you're going to be the person responsible for that answer, then you're in a yeah, very strong position. I can almost feel on Google it going back to Google Plus. When you, do you remember when you had your profiles and you'd get your profile against? That never took off that, actually. It feels like it might end up being again. So or maybe Google was too ahead of their time. And uh, um, and you mentioned SGE just for the audience because that's still quite new. Some people might not know about it. Um SGE, so search generative experience? Yes. Um, it's in testing at the moment. It has been for a while. Uh, I think it's still in the US and Japan. You can enroll into it to test it if you want to. It doesn't mean just because you're not in the US, you'd have to use Google US effectively to test it. Um, yeah, it's about providing AI-generated answers to particular search queries. It is very uh, top-heavy. You have to scroll quite a lot past the AI content before you get to natural search results. So it is a little bit scary in that regard. But I think we've also seen that before and so I've talked about feature snippets having been there before. Um, I don't think it's, in my opinion, too much of a change. And I don't think in the current form of it, it's very, um, I think we still need some AI, some trust in AI before Google can start to roll that out uh, in reality. Because otherwise there's a lot of creative answers going to be driven there. And we've already seen Google has some negative press from its own AI uh, when they rolled out uh, it to begin with. Yeah. So in my opinion, there's quite a long way to go on that, but it's worth keeping tabs on as well, for sure. Definitely. And I guess it all comes back to like the platforms can come up with these new ways of doing things, et cetera. But actually, we also then need to look at the human adoption. So another question coming up to Gary is just around one of the reasons you've joined the team is because we here are realizing how much the young people, the Gen Z, they're moving to TikTok for their search. They're yeah. not using Google as much. So Andy's a bit old-fashioned over here for the uh, for the answers. Sorry about that. Well, it's funny. It's actually a bit of both, right? I, I, I don't. Everyone goes, oh God, you know, Google's on the way out. Everyone's searching on TikTok. But Google's never going away. Definitely from a search engine perspective, either. Uh, but it is also about keywords. TikTok, yes, it's really, it's got a really good search facility, right? The function of it. Like if you try and search for something on Instagram, for example. Uh, it doesn't give you the results that you would get if you got it on TikTok. You could get the video you thought you saw a couple of days ago straight away if you searched for it, searched a description of it. But that's because it also takes when they're now taking in keywords, for, for example, and also uh, it knows the difference from a video perspective uh, between a wooden table and a brown dog in the video, right? So it is starting to recognize that there are different objects in there. So it, Yes, keywords are super important. Uh, and all the Gen Zers, again, it's that video content. They wanted something visual straight away, an emotive story, uh, connect with the person. And also what I call the, the mirror strategy, where they want to see themselves yeah. in the video, right? And this goes back to that human behavioral stuff, right? Where I, if, I, you know, if you're selling to me, I don't necessarily want to see a 70-year-old female talking about numbers in the video, right? I want to see a bearded hipster talking about colors and painting and stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a mixture of keywords and uh, what the audience wants and what's in the video, and you need to put that first uh, and short form as well. You know, you you got to put content across all platforms and not the same content at the same time. Everyone makes this mistake, and I'll talk about challenges later. Everyone makes this mistake around putting the same video on every platform 
at the same time of day. Yeah. And actually, there's no reason for me to follow other accounts if I'm just going to get the same content on the account That's for one, right. for, for example, right? And everybody's on every platform. They're just having different conversations in different yeah. platforms, right? So you've got to change the content for what people are searching for. And it is about the customer journey. So actually, yeah. I booked a holiday recently and I used everything that we do as part of that booking. I started on Google. I narrowed it down to, well, actually, I ended up in a digital PR haze because I was looking for the best foodie um, hotels and I found a digital PR piece that was around the top 10 foodie places in Mexico, um, or Cancun, classy. Um, then I had the paid ads for all of the hotels I went and looked at coming back and they going, you want to book, you want to book. This is such then a good example. I went on to Instagram, I'm too old for TikTok. I went on to Instagram and I searched, I didn't want to see their profile. Yeah. I wanted to the raw stuff. generate yeah. concept. Yeah. And this is why customer journey mapping, coming back to Kieran, I said it touched all of you, is so important though, because a brand has to understand that that is, it touches all of it and you can't just be doing one piece of it. You can't just have the same thing everywhere. No. Also for us as well, we, we comment on these, these trending, um, videos on TikTok um it's such an important thing for us at the moment so we have a lot of expert comment uh, expert people in in our uh within our clients that will then comment on perhaps like the other day we uh, we have a pet insurance company we work with a vet um and there was a viral TikTok of a dog that was going back into a head collar cone and you know they famously don't like to be in them but this particular one was like I want to get back in it so we got our vets to talk about a lot like, why why does this dog want to go back into the code but it was it was a trending story it's a, the journalists are picking it up they wanted some reaction to it and that is what we're constantly getting um, yeah. uh, from journalists that they that that kind of content is what they want to be publishing as yeah. well and we need to be that's a good example of a viral video there we go. it was unexpected yeah, so you share it to get yeah. the people to experience yeah. it love it now i've got one more question from the audience uh then we're going to do some feedback so audience be thinking about your feedback because i'm going to ask you because i'm also going to tease you with the final question which is a really good one so let's just go david to love to shop has come in with a live question for us uh, and this is for you joe so what is your most successful outreach campaign and what are your top tactics to acquire backlinks coverage and also the third part oh. how do you measure the success <laughs> oh gosh uh what is our biggest one we've had quite a few actually don't mean to brag um <laughs> that's not very bragging line, by the way um so i think actually going back to tiktok it's such a, a, a a big thing that we do use a lot of um last year we had oh there's, there's quite a few again for the pet insurance company Pick your pay. Pick oh, your pay. so many um so we ran one that was um the most famous uh, the, the the top pet names of 2023 we trawled through all the data from this pet insurance company or my colleague did bless her heart i just literally trawled through all the names but then we were like noticed in trends there was um royal family um pet names that were coming up there was also um, celebrity names and they were the most obscure. So we broke it down into what we could do, like the top lists for each one. And um, knowing that the journalists at the, like the, for the royal pet names would like likes of hello, that is their kind of content. They want like royal names, like the, the dogs named, um, been named Lilibet or something after the queen. Um, then you've got the, the celebrity ones that are trending now. I don't really know many. <laughs> Who need that? Who's famous at the moment? Um, and then, in terms of like the most obscure, we had ham and cheese baguette or sandwich or something. Uh, was like there was one and one. It was one. It was absolutely bonkers. And I was like, I love this. So we went, we went with that one as well. And that went on like the Metro, the Mail. They loved that. They picked wow. that up. Um, and that just went off. But it also then generated. We it, we, we send it to the Mirror uh, called like the the umbrella brand is Reach PLC. And they will circulate that kind of content as well. So that then goes across the whole of all of their publications. So Kent Live, Somerset Live, Cambridge Live, all the lives, which is great for us because then we get more links. <laughs> we love that kind of content as well. Um, and the clever thing yeah. there, I guess, is that you've um, personalised it to the titles as well. So it was the same piece of research. Absolutely. The same story, mm -hmm. but getting the right bit for thinking about absolutely the royals link with the hello yeah okay and cool. it fit the client kpis they want the the links and the brand awareness and they want to be where they're they haven't got this bigger budget as the bigger pet insurance companies but we're doing more than what they actually that their competitors were getting and being featured in more publications than they are as well um so it ticked all the boxes um and then we obviously had all the content sitting on the website so people could go back look at the full data set and etc so it was is a really like effective piece for us 
Um, there's so, so many. many more were there. There were. <laughs> and we are getting close to time. So, and measuring that, I guess it was it's back to the client, isn't it? The back client. to the client. Um, they wanted brand awareness um, and links, which is, we ticked all the boxes for that. Um, but also engagements. How many of these pieces got engagements? That was a big thing for us. And we, that's how we measure it as well, using our um, tools that we use. Um, yeah, and I and sales as well. Obviously, that's going to have a big impact. As if they yeah. if they can sell a product, that's what they ultimately want as well. So definitely, definitely amazing. Right, we're going to ask you guys for feedback. So please give us some feedback. So, um, if you've been to one of our bunch of learns before, we always make you do this on the call because the thing is, we understand humans. And I don't know about you, I've been on these things before, and they're like, "We'll send you the link afterwards." You never fill it in. You never, you were best intentions, but we just don't do it, do we? We get busy and we forget. So we make time for you to do it now. So I'm going to tell you what the last question is, because this will mean that you stay around as well, because it is a good one. And it gives you guys time to think about your answers. So our last question, uh, inspired by Megan at Copia Digital. Um, so she said, what's the biggest challenge for marketers in 2024? And then I've just added to the end, and what can people do? Like one tip to overcome the challenge. So you guys can be thinking, you guys are going to hang around because we want your answers. And Chantel is going to pop into the chat, if she hasn't already, a link so that you can just go and give us some feedback because we'd love to know your chance as well to tell us what other content you want in future because we can run more of these. We love running these. Um, love to know if you like panel format as well. Um, if you've been to ours before, you know they're normally more one-on-one. So um, yeah, all your feedback. We're going to pop some music on for you and we'll be back in about, I reckon, 90 seconds to get their answers. So just a reminder, this question is, in your opinion, so I'm going to come to each of you, what's the biggest challenge for marketers in 2024? And what can they do to overcome it? One little tip. And we're going to start with Gary. Uh, cool. Biggest challenge is not creating enough content. There is no business out there that's creating enough video content. Uh, some people are creating like one video a week, three videos a week, still not enough. You, you know, I think as a tip, you want to batch create. You know, you want minimum disruption in the office. So if you can sort out an itinerary and smash out 50 videos in a day that's the way to do it and then schedule it over the next kind of 50 weeks right uh the way that we would do is a content cascade so we'd probably do something like a half hour podcast uh we'd have uh maybe 10 short form videos cut from that podcast we'd have the full 30 minute hero video from that podcast the audio to go over spotify and apple we'd probably transcribe it turn it into a blog probably cut tweets out of that blog well from the transcription uh so and that just in one half hour sesh has created 30 pieces of content uh so you want to work uh smarter not harder and uh it's a batch creation minimum disruption in the office and pick people that want to be on camera there's a lot of people that don't yeah right some of the people here in the in uh, the live stream didn't want to be here no uh, really, that's a trick. yeah but uh yeah you want to pick people uh that want to be on camera because that will just make it smoother and right? that will okay. that will actually one quick question to that. If you're doing a whole day, lots of content, do you need lots of output changes? Like, is that a problem people keep seeing? I, I've done both. I, I think uh, it depends. It's the same as a stock photography. I think, yes, uh, it's good to have, you know, quickly change the jacket or whatever. Yeah. But it, you, you want to oh, do... Changing, I like that. Yeah. And uh, you want to do batch creation once a quarter. Yeah. So actually, it's not so bad, right? It's not that you do it once and then that's it for the year because you need to make 50 videos a month, right? Yeah. So, Perspective. Love it. Yeah. On to Kieran. Challenge. Um, I think personalization and data privacy together, um, you know, yeah. we want to get more personal, people want personalized content, but also quite rightly, people are becoming more and more aware of how their data is used and they're yeah. quite cautious, which they should be. But obviously then that's a challenge to get that information and uh, personalize um, the marketing. So top tip, I think, would be um, to try and be a bit more transparent about how their data is used. Um, people don't want to go through and read like really long terms and conditions either to f figure out what is going on with their data. So try and make it simple, make it easy, um, you know, use the EAST framework, which is make it easy, attractive, simple and timely. So um, Love it. just, yeah, think about what they need to know. And uh, that's it, really. Love it. Lovely. Lovely. Well, I'm going to have a measurement, which actually is quite a big topic. So I'm going to try and sort of hone that down because um, that could cover all sorts of things from like measurement frameworks. Um, yeah, it's sort of deprecation of cookies, but um, I'm going to talk about you know, for J4. So I think that's going to be quite a big challenge for a lot of big brands where potentially smaller brands have already transitioned over to GA4. Um, some of the bigger brands are obviously starting that process more so now and having to rely on that GA4 data. I think that's going to be a big um, sort of transition and a challenge for bigger businesses where all of a sudden the data doesn't match what they're previously used to. 
Um, and I think the biggest thing to do there is to obviously be able to quantify the difference between the two and obviously educate the business. So I think if you're in that position where you're kind of moving to that GA4 and you haven't gone through an educational piece, not just with your direct marketing team, but the, the more senior people, the directors, board as well, so that they understand what this change means, then you're just going to constantly have that battle on your hands between, well, the data now shows that things are down. They're not down, they're just being attributed in a different way. And I think that's going to be a big challenge a lot of businesses are focusing. But I think you can definitely do it if you plan and educate. Love it. So um, being the first, um, it's, it's tricky. There's a lot of digital PR people out there that are doing probably the same kind of thing as you. Um, my top tip is just to elevate it. How can you elevate this further? Is there more data that I keep saying? Um, have you got a case study? Can you just elevate it, elevate it that one more? Hook onto a trend. Um, just really, really hone it in. You've got to you've got to be there first and you've got to be the best. And also stick to the basics. It's like go back to your content calendar, stick to that, plan in advance, as Dr. was saying, and then you should be fine. Love it. Andy, last but not least. Um, I think going back to the elevate word, I think it's a good one for SEOs. Um, demonstrating your experience. Um, there's a lot of AI content being put out now. Um, seen in particular in a lot of clients industries that uh, niche businesses are getting much more um, predominance in search results because they're demonstrating their experience and their actual um, authority in that market. So what can you do to show that you actually do have experience in your market? Is it creating help and, help and advice guide, help and advice guides, user guides, video content, demonstrate that you actually uh, do go that extra mile for your customers? Love it. Content, privacy, metrics, tracking, all of it. Thank you guys so much. Like, I've learned loads. I've loved it. And um, I hope you've all really enjoyed it. There's going to be a recording of this, which we'll share. So we'll follow up with everyone. Um, we're also going to have a blog post written up about this. Um, there were some extra questions that we haven't got to. So anyone that's submitted one that we didn't answer, we'll try and come back to you in the next few days, next week, maybe. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Keep an eye out for our next Crunch and Learns. You'll be on our list after today, so we'll let you know. Um, we'll be using your feedback, so that might help inform our next Crunch and Learn. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I've been Becky. We are Reflect Digital. We're here to unleash your performance. So thank you so much. <laughs>